extra things like that to, you know, develop and present your stories. Anyway, uh, my name is uh, Curtis Dupuy, and my mother is Hazel Pete, and uh, we live on the reservation. And um, just as a storyteller, my first time I told stories in this building was on Saturday, July 11th, 1972. Wow. And the reason I remember that is um, the children's librarian was uh, Judy Ann Wilson. And I knew her, you know, just generally, you know, uh, from my associations with the library programs. But uh, she introduced me down here, and that's when we formally met. So I did a variety of stories, and she would, uh, you know, do the introductions and things like that. And so, um, we you know, have a hamburger or a pizza or something like that. So then after about a year, I started hustling. And then uh, a year later, you know, two years after we met and we got married. <laughs> so, this was a good library, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I checked her out. Huh? <laughs> anyway, what I wanted to do was, um, I brought some artifacts with me, just uh, as examples. and. Uh, one of the first ones that I have is this talking stick. So when you look at these talking sticks, when you have, oh, maybe an important meeting or a contentious uh, matter that you want to talk about and people are going to be mad or shouting or something like that, when we're in an audience to make sure that there's order, whoever is going to uh, announce the meeting and be in charge of the meeting would have this talking stick. The meeting will begin. Uh, that person would make their uh, presentation, and then uh, maybe you have a uh, position in opposition. You'd want to be the speaker, so you'd get up, and hold on to it, and say, "I don't like the idea because uh, we don't have enough food." Or you know, maybe you would say, "Well, that's a good idea because the room's hot and warm all the time." Whatever you know the issues are, so you have this talking stick. And uh, these are um, deer hooks. And then, you know, just a, uh, you know, a symbol on top. So we've had this, you know, many years. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to have a question at the end of my presentation. And here's this item here that I want you to look at. And what it's used, what it is uh, done is carried by the last person in the traveling party. So wherever you're going, the last person in the party, you know, three people, nine people, four people, whatever, how many people were in the party, you know, the last person would be carrying this. So you can think about what it could be used for. Now, some people may know, and so don't say. <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to show is, like it's already been stated, uh, I've uh, done, uh, in 2006, I uh, recited some stories. I, I know 29 stories altogether. And I had been um, invited by a uh, lady from the uh, National Historic Society in Washington, D.C. to uh, recite stories. So when I was thinking about you know, how many stories I learned and everything like that and how many I could still remember, I wrote them all down and I came up with uh, 29 stories. Uh, we made them into a CD and this is here at the library and you could check it out. It has, I think, uh, 14 stories here. There's altogether 29 stories, but only 14 are on the uh, tape. Another item that I wanted to show you is that this is just one piece of wood. And so whoever the carver was, you know, just started cutting it down. And so when you look at this, you always wonder, you know, an artist, the painter, the floral arranger, the, the stone cutter, whatever, they have to see something. And, you know, they work on it to realize it. 
So this person that did this carving did well. We've had this uh, many years. And I always just think, boy, I could see something like this, but I could never make it. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is high quality work. Yeah, I wanted to know, um, is it somebody that sat and whittled it away? Yeah, right. Awesome. We just used his uh, saw and cut it out. And, then and how did they make How did they make it so smooth? How did they do that? Uh, probably just sandpaper, you know, like. And those hours. Oh, I suppose <laughs> over time. Huh? And over time it. Yeah. Down. Well, he probably sanded it down and everything Beautiful. like that. Then he, you know, put on the curves and the eyes and mm -hmm. the tail and the wings. But, you know, when you look at any artesian, you know, like there's that man in Tonino that works with that soapstone over there by the um, Tumwater pool, that, you know, old swimming pool by the railroad station. You know, that person is very skillful. He's elderly. Well, I don't know how elderly I mean, because I'm uh, 78, but uh, he looks older than me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when you look at what he does with that soapstone, just take a block of wood and just start, you know, using his little axe and, or, you know, hammer and start chipping away, you know, makes it rough. And then he starts using his files and everything, you know, you just wonder you know, how people can realize what they see. Because I could, you know, chip away and i just have a great big old crumbled bunch of uh, stone. <laughs> I wouldn't have it very much. The other thing that we look at is, um, uh, my family is basket makers. And we've made baskets since time began. I live over there at uh, Black River Bridge on Hawana Road, where the Black River goes across on the road. I lived there, and uh, I'm the fourth person to live there since uh, 1830. So generally, uh, the grandkid moves in. You live there until you're gone. So my grandpa went and got there all in 1918, lived until 1967. I moved in, and I've been there since 74. So I've been there at 26, and 20. I've been there 46 years. And I'm still here, so. When I look at my three kids, I don't know that any of them will choose to live there, but I have grandkids that would probably, you know, move in. So when you look at my place over there, uh, a long time ago, um, on the part of the land where I live, where the house is, in back was the uh, high water canoe landing. So when the water was flooding and everything and the river was up, people would be in their canoes and they'd be paddling. Well, they would uh, go up the river, past the bridge about a block, and you come to the high water canoe landing because after that point, there's a lot of ripples. So if you're going to paddle up the ripples, you really got to paddle and everything like that. So they would probably park their uh, canoe, then they start walking to Olympia, to Little Rock, to uh, Shelton, you know, there's, uh, trails through the mountains, if you know where they are. And um, I guess you just kept on practicing, you know, in the beginning, like 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. You might walk this way and get lost, and you'd walk that way and get lost, but finally you'd find your trail and you'd mark it. So after a while, everyone knew where the trail was, just like I-5, you know, <laughs> exit 20, uh, 25 or exit 88. You would know where you were. So anyway, um, what happened is um, that was the high water canoe landing. On the other side of the road then uh, where the river is, uh, that was the low water canoe landing because when you'd be paddling up and down the river, coming up the river, you would come to that place and then that's where the ripples start and the water would be low. So you just park your canoe and start walking again. So the difference between the high water and the low water canoe landing is only about three blocks. But by river uh, distance, it's about a mile. But um, we have a mark. I have a mark anyway. But uh, those are the things that we recite, you know, that we talk about uh, because we still remember and everything. Anyway, I wanted to show you this small basket. We're basket makers and the smaller the basket that you could make, the finer detail, 
the better quality basket maker you were. So my mother is Hazel Pete, and she could make a basket probably about as big as your little digit. That was tiny. You know, and it was, you know, skillful, it was color, it was balanced, it was correct. Mm -hmm. And so the smaller your basket you could make, the better quality basket maker you are. So this is just a larger one. I couldn't find a real tiny one. But uh, you can see, you know, she uh, put in her designs, put in her colors and everything like that. And uh, <laughs> if I was doing this, I'd have to use a rope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, mine would be about, you know, big as that desk <laughs> because I'd have to use rope because I don't know how you see this and I don't know how you do it. But uh, it's way beyond my skill. <laughs> Another item here using different materials is there's cedar root here on the bottom, there's sweet grass here, and uh, these are just things that we make. And uh, I have uh, basket material and other artifacts that go back to the 1850s, 1840s, and things like that. So uh, what we do is you know, we accumulate them and we hardly ever let them go. You know, they're uh, like if, you know, this lady right here was, you know, a basket maker and she did something, maybe her very first basket would keep it, would mark it. So that we could see, you know, 30 years ago, this is what she did yesterday and this is what she did today. Yeah. So you can see that. Another item that I have here then is uh, this spoon. So it's just another, you know, plain piece of wood, uh, a limb. The person seen something and he just started uh, carving. And you can see his rough cuts on the inside. You can see where it's smooth and he probably used uh, sandpaper on that. And then to give it a design, he put the whale on it. So, you know, when people look at it, you know, you just wonder how you can achieve it. I mean, you know, it's beyond my mind. But the other thing, though, is like in the 1830s, 1870s, you know, we didn't have any metal, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have a drill, we didn't have metal. And you just think about, gosh, those people must have been sitting there a long time doing this. You know, more time than I can have. Yeah, I just wanted to know, uh, what kind of wood do they use in the... Uh, this is cedar. Doing? This is cedar. Oh, okay. So uh, again, I want to remind you now, I want to know the name of the utility of this item that was carried by the last person in the traveling party. One person, three people, nine people. Whoever was the last person used this. A long time ago when the earth was young and people and animals lived together, on the Chehalis over here, there was a small village and in this uh, village, one morning, all the people were sitting there and uh, they were just sitting like us talking. And they said, boy, it sure is good today. And everybody nodded their head. And the other person said, it's really good. It's even better because one family is gone. Everybody looked at each other and they smiled and they nodded their heads some more. And then what they were talking about was the mosquito family. <laughs> because the mosquito family, you know, had came in sizes like uh, tennis balls and golf balls and marbles and the baby ones. And uh, what they would do is they would be flying around. There might be a flock of them. I don't know what you call them, a swarm or a herd. But there'd be a flock of uh, of these mosquitoes, and they would be hungry, so they might come and visit you and they'd eat you. You know, take three or four bites or ten bites and they would take the blood and take the meat and then you'd be sick. You would say, oh gosh darn, I got bit again. And so uh, when the mosquitoes went there, people were pretty happy. So the uh, people were in this group and there was, you know, like deer and uh, beaver and elk and, you know, muskrat. Everybody was sitting there nodding their head. Finally, one person raised his hand. He says, hey you guys. Uh, what if we had a uh, big evening party? We had supper. 
and uh, we invite these uh, mosquitoes over. They'll be the guest of honor, and they can eat first. And then we'll hit them over the head and put them in the fire. Everybody was sitting there talking, but that'd be really good because then we wouldn't have the problems that we have today. But one person says, uh, those mosquitoes, they fly real high and they fly real fast. What are we going to do? How do we get them? And that first person that talks says, well, if we have this soup and we fill them up and they eat a whole bunch, they'll be fat and they won't fly very high and they won't fly, you know, fly very fast. Well, that's okay. Uh, what, uh, where are we going to do this and when are we going to do this? Uh, they said, oh, Sunday night, we'll go up to a place we, we call Dones's. We'll go up to Dones's and uh, we'll invite them. So when you guys go home today and tonight, if you see any mosquitoes, tell them that we're going to uh, have supper. They're the guests of honor. They get to eat first. So that day came and the people gathered at Dones's and they were sitting there and they got ready to make their soup. They said, oh my goodness, what type of soup are we going to do? And they sat there and they thought, and they said, we'll make bean soup. Okay, so they got ready to make bean soup. The time came, the sun was going down, it was getting darker, and here came these mosquitoes. There were so many of the mosquitoes that when you looked at the tree, the limbs started to bend. There was a lot of mosquitoes. And uh, one mosquito leader was there, and he's walking around, flying around, looking. Gosh, what's that? Oh, it doesn't smell very good. And then he looked, he, gosh, it even looks worse. Uh, what type of soup is this? Bean soup. Everybody, all those mosquitoes looked at each other and said, geez, I don't know. Have you guys eaten bean soup? They said, no, we're not going to eat bean soup. So anyway, that leader mosquito said to the people, well, uh, we really are glad and thankful for the invitation. We want to eat supper with you. We want to be the guest of honor, but we'll have to skip tonight because it's bean soup. We don't eat bean soup. So they all left. So everybody stayed there and they had their bean soup and it was really good and they were happy. Well, anyway, they got there and they said, now what are we going to do? And he says, well, let's go to uh, Boho. We'll do it again. So when you see those mosquitoes, invite them again and tell them Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. So they talked to the mosquitoes. Tuesday night afternoon came. They went to uh, Boho and um, they got ready to cook. Finally, uh, here comes the mosquitoes. They got on those trees again. The limbs are about ready to break. And, um, gee, it doesn't smell very much better than last time. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know what you guys are cooking. Then he looked, he said, oh no. Well, anyway, it was tomato soup. So then they, so all the mosquitoes looked at each other and they said, no, we don't eat tomato soup. So they said they're, uh, sorry and they had to leave and they left so now all the people and animals and birds were there and they had uh, tomato soup and it's really good eating they said now what are we going to do they said well we'll go to another place we'll go up here you know just to uh to our ball field they said okay and they said but this time everybody has to get there and everybody has to be there early this is going to be a special soup so anyway, that day came, it was noon. They were all there, everybody was standing in line, you know, looking around, and that leader person says, all right, make two lines, make two lines. So everybody started getting a line and everything, and they were trying to look around and see how come. They said, all right, uh, what are we going to do? He says, I'll show you, we're gonna make a special soup today. So he said, come here, elk boy, you're first. Well, elk boy come trotting up there and he said, oh boy, I'm first, it's lucky me. I wonder what we're going to do. Well, anyway, he says, give me your hoof. And elk boy put out his hoof. We had a sharp knife. He made a small cut and the blood started coming out. It went into the pot. 
finally here comes Beaver and he made some and uh, a mouse came by and he made some blood and everything and finally a uh, skunk showed up. <laughs> give me your paw, skunk. He says, I'll give you my tail. <laughs> so he says, oh, you can rest over there. We might not need your blood today, skunk. So he went over on the side. <laughs> More people and animals came by and uh, finally bear showed up. Give me your paw, bear. He said, I'll give it to you. And he had his hand like this. He says, you can go uh, rest with skunk. We might not need your blood. <laughs> so anyway, he went over there and finally the three pots were full. They started cooking. The time came for the meal and all the mosquitoes came in. Their, uh, the limbs on the trees started to you know, bend down. There was a lot of mosquitoes. The leader mosquito says, oh gosh, whoever smelled such a good smelling soup? Oh my goodness, that must be a good soup. And then he, he said, it even looks good too. It even looks better. Oh my goodness, we're lucky today. Well anyway, they said, it's time to eat. You're the guest of honor. All you mosquitoes, go ahead and eat. So the mosquitoes were flying around. They'd get their bowl and eat, get their bowl and eat. Finally, the soup was gone. The mosquitoes were full. And that one person said, now, hit them over the head and throw them in the fire. So they went by and uh, they had their clubs and everything. And uh, when the mosquitoes seen what happened, they tried to fly, but they didn't fly very high. And they didn't fly very fast. Well, elk and deer, they were together and they had their horns. And they made a line and just ran through the flock of mosquitoes. And uh, when they got on the other side, they pulled them off their antlers and threw them in. Uh, raccoon and uh, bear and cougar were fighting and they'd hit them and you know, claw them up and throw them into fire. So anyway, uh, they were almost done. The only ones left were the little baby mosquitoes. And they said, those little baby mosquitoes are pretty hard to get. It's hard to get them, they're too small. What are we gonna do? And the wise man said, uh, just leave them be. We'll get them next time. <laughs> That's how come we have mosquitoes today. <laughs> yep. So we still got them. So anyway, uh, I'm uh, 78. I was born in 1944. And on the reservation, uh, we didn't have electricity until 1956. So we had outdoor toilets, we had hand water pumps, you had kerosene uh, washing machines, you had clothes lines for drying your clothes, you had wood stove to heat the house, a wood stove in the kitchen. You know, for you people that might have lived that way or heard your parents talking about that way, that's how we lived. When we were, uh, 1958 is when they blacktopped the road and so, before 1958 until they blacktopped the road, the, the pebbles, the smallest rocks are about this small. I mean, you know, it's like going to the ocean or something, or, you know, it really ain't, you know, driving around, breaking your windshield and things like that. Well, anyway, uh, because we didn't have the electricity, uh, we didn't have the uh, television, um, not very many of us had uh, newspapers, and uh, the other thing was that uh, we had those radios and that you know the battery radios were probably about 30 inches long you know eight inches wide eight inches deep probably weighed 40 pounds but when you listen to the radio uh, you only listen maybe to the radio if we had reception because we're in the mountains here you might only hear uh, the radio for uh, you know, three hours, two hours a day, not very much. So you know, you knew when your shows were on and uh, you would be uh, waiting and you'd hope that it would be on. So you'd turn your radio on and you could just hear like the last of the show, like the shadow knows and crunch. And you wouldn't know what happened. <laughs> you didn't know what it was going to be. <laughs> or anything like that, or uh, you had to listen to another one, 
want her to be, uh, hi old silver and away, you know, and be like that. Uh, the other thing then was uh, because we didn't have uh, uh, electricity when we had those uh, refrigerators. They were large refrigerators, oh, they were large, but we used blocks of ice. So when we had the blocks of ice we used to, in uh, November, only have to have one block of ice for two weeks. But in uh, July, you might have three blocks of ice in one week. And uh, you would uh, fill it up with the ice, you would put your materials in there and uh, keep them cool. So uh, that's how we kept things cool. The other thing then was uh, because we didn't have the refrigeration and everything, what we did was a lot of canning. So uh, grandma and grandpa and my aunts and uncles, the, the families in the reservation would can, and so they might can 250, 300 cans of fruit a year, alpha sauce, uh, you know, peaches, pears, and everything. I mean, there was just a large amount. And then uh, when we did uh, vegetables, uh, we might take squash and everything, you cut them up into small squares and you could dry them. And you know, then you just put them in your paper sack or in your uh, glass. You know, they could be just saved that way. And the beans, you know, you just uh, sh shell the beans. I guess I can't remember what the word is called, but you'd shell the beans and save them. So you'd have, you know, like two gallons of white beans, two gallons of brown beans, and things like that. So anyway. Uh, that's how we live, but how the children were is uh, grandma and grandpa lived there at the uh, Black River Bridge where I live. And uh, Friday afternoon, Friday evening, mom and dad would take uh, me and my brother Mo, and my younger brother Mo, that's gone now. And uh, they would take us down there. One is to get us out of the house and kick you out for the weekend. But secondly, is that we could go and help grandma and grandpa do things like pick their apples or uh, make sure the smokehouse was smoking fish and things like that. But the thing that uh, grandma did, uh, Harriet Pete and Frank Pete did, was uh, because we didn't have the radio, we didn't have the uh, newspapers and things like that, what they would do is talk to you. And so we'd sit there and talk, and they'd say, we're going to tell you a story. And they'd start reciting something. Well, what happens is that after a period of time, six months, three months or something, they say, Curtis, uh, you tell us a story. So when I was only a first grader or second grader, I could say, you know, Little Red uh, uh, Henny Penny or Little Red Riding Hood or something like that. But, you know, on the Indian stories. But then um, they said, no, you got to learn more of the uh, older stories. So then they would start talking to me. Well, what happened is when we were there, they would say, you know, you have to uh, give uh, animation to your stories. You have to project. So one is you speak loudly. Make sure your audience can hear you. When you say, we caught a big fish, don't go like this. Say, we caught a big fish. It was 40 pounds. Or, uh, you know, uh, when we were walking through the woods and we heard scary noises, you know, you look and you, you know, uh, portray the scene that you want to project. So that's what Grandma and Grandpa did. And the second thing then is uh, when uh, you recited the stories, you would just start talking like a long time ago when the earth was young and uh, birds and animals and people live together. Uh, we'd start out with a story and they'd say, stop. Uh, you're confusing two stories and the same story. You gotta make sure you're, which story you're talking about. So then you'd start all over again. Then uh, the second thing is, um, stop, you're out of order. You know, what you're saying now is episode four or five, you know, and you haven't said number three yet. So you were severely critiqued. I mean, one is they wanted you to learn, but two, they wanted you to remember. Because uh, these stories haven't been written down, they haven't been recorded, they haven't been videotaped except for what I did. And so grandma and grandpa wanted me to uh, learn and to remember. 
And so when I was young, say in the 52s, 54s, uh, they would say, uh, don't write them down, don't record them, uh, don't, you know, videotape. We didn't have any videotape or recordings. But they said, don't do that. They said, if these stories, if these stories are important, uh, other people will learn them and they'll continue. But when I think about all the stories I learned in the 50s and 52, 54, 56, until 62 when I left home, when I was invited by that lady to, uh, to recite my stories, of all the stories I learned, 50 or 100 of them or something, when I wrote them down, I only could uh, remember 29 stories. And then I looked at my kids, you know, I have uh, twin girls and a boy. And then I look at my nieces and nephews, and I was thinking about, well, how many stories do they know? How many stories can they remember? So like this person here might know three stories, and this person will learn two stories, and this person could remember uh, six half stories. It wasn't good, but then I had that invitation to be a storyteller. But it took me about two years to come to the uh, acceptance of uh, recording the stories because I still remember what grandma and grandpa told me. They said, don't write them down, don't record them, don't videotape them. If they're important, people will remember. But then I looked at the audience and I said, gosh, no one knows them. And if I'm gone, they're really gone. And so anyway, out of all the stories, and there were three uh, pornographic stories, that I'm probably about the only one that knows them and I don't recite them because I don't talk that way. <laughs> so those stories for sure are gonna be gone when I'm gone. But uh, there was just a lot of uh, effort, you know, about this. A long time ago when the earth was young, People and animals lived together. There was this magic man, his name was Juana. And what he would do is he'd walk up and down these rivers and valleys. He'd go up and down these hills and creeks. He'd find the bear family and the beaver family and the coyotes and the elk. And he knew all of them and he would talk to them. But one time on all these travels and everything, he was in the mud because it's Western Washington, it rains. Everything that you did was in the mud. So in the summer, it'd be muddy. You'd be you know, getting your clothes muddy, your feet would be muddy. You'd be muddy, you couldn't dry out and everything. And he says, gosh darn, I'm tired of being in mud. And he was trying to uh, walk around, he was falling in, and he's an older person. And he says, oh gosh darn, I wish I could do something. Well, anyway, there was a, uh, tree that fell down. He said, I just get out of this mud for a while and he stood on the on the tree. And it was slick and everything. He was having a hard time holding his balance. Well anyway there's a limb there and he said, gosh darn, I'll just hold on to this limb and uh, that'll stop me from falling off. Why well, when he grabbed hold of the limb it broke. So he almost fell out again. Well, he was sitting on this uh, tree and he says, gosh darn, oh, I'm gonna fall. And he took that uh, limb and he stuck it in the ground so that uh, he wouldn't fall. Well, when he started falling, he pushed that stick real hard and that log started moving. He says, oh my goodness, look at that. <clears throat> so then he did it again and that log moved again. He did it again, and he did it again, you know, the log moved again. So today, when we look at all these rivers and creeks, that's where he was when he was uh, on that log, pushing to make the river channels so that the land would be dry. And that's how come we're, we're not in the mud like we used to be. Oh, <laughs> uh, you see me uh, all the time. We don't have words like the end or that's all or conclusion. You just stop talking, you lift your hands up and uh, that's it. <laughs> I mean, at least that's how I learned, so I don't know. When I uh, look at uh, what I am today and 
what I remember and what I practice. When I think about this and I look at all the other people, what I learned is evaporating, is almost gone. So here we are in this audience and uh, some speakers, you know, when they get done talking and everything, everybody, oh, great speech or something like that. But for the older Indians, we never would do that. We'd just raise our hand and uh, just nod your head, just raise your hand. And if someone started clapping, we'd look at them to see how come they were uneducated, <laughs> or if they haven't been trained, or if they don't remember. You know, it's those type of things that I still do. And so um, when I'm with my children, you know, we're in the audience and everything. You know, they know if they're sitting by me, they better not be going like this. <laughs> and you know, uh, me and my nieces and nephews also understand that too. So there's just a lot of things that uh, are evaporating that, you know, when I'm gone, they're almost going to be gone too. Does anyone want to guess about the significance of this painting? I see a basket. Huh? I see a basket. See these people with talking stick? And the type of animal? Well, this is the uh, ant lady, and she has her basket. And what she does, she walks around through all the villages, to the houses, to the people and uh, animals and the birds. And what she carries in her basket is when she visits you, she'll take your sadness and your sorrows and your disappointments and put them in a basket and carry them away to you know, make you clean, make you, I guess, have a better life or enjoy life. But this is a uh, ant lady, and what she's doing is walking around with her walking stick and her basket, and she visits you and knows when you're sad, you're sorry, you know, things aren't going good, you got a drinking problem, an alcohol problem, there's not very much we can do about illness and things like that, medical issues. But for all these other items, she would take them away from you and carry them away. This here is just an old basket that we made, or not a basket, mm -hmm. but it's uh, just a doll that we made a long time ago, probably in the 50s, 70 years ago. So um, it's just, you know, one of our uh, artifacts. I don't know if you call them relics yet. But mm -hmm. I don't know what the proper term is, but uh, we have that. A long time ago in the sets up in the Wainuche area over there, that sets up in Brady and uh, Montezano on those two rivers there. Well, those early explorers, what they would do is they'd come by and they'd be you know, taking their notes and writing down their facts and things like that. Well, what happened is that they found uh, five uh, plaques with different figures, and I have them up there. <coughs> I brought this just as a sample. But what these are is uh, headstones. So I don't know how much before the white man got here or how long we had been doing this, but you know, for the people that were gone when we buried them, to remember them, we still had our headstones. So. I always was wondering, like, when you go and look at Brady and Satsup and the Wainuchi and the Chehalis and the Satsup and Wainuchi rivers, well, there's a lot of flood changes. I mean, every year that channel changes. And those uh, early explorers said that they found these on the riverbanks. Well, I don't know why the burial grounds would be on the riverbanks when, you know, the channel changes all the time and, uh, you know, the bodies would be uh, washed away. But this is where they uh, found these uh, headstones. Are they, is it wood? 
Yeah. It was cedar? Oh, I don't know what wood they use, oh, but cool. this is made out of cedar. But um, what happened was, um, this is what those early uh, explorers So this is made in all of the 50s. And uh, what this is, is a storyteller. So when we didn't have the electricity, um, when we didn't have lamps, we didn't have kerosene, we didn't have uh, you know those gas lamps that you pumped up. Well, what happened is um, we'd go to bed early, like at 5.30 or 6. And um, like up there where I lived in the beginning, what happened was that um, maybe uh, 10 houses, well, nine of the houses were relatives. They'd be grandma and grandpa, and there'd be two uncles and three aunts and 15 cousins. So like when I was young, maybe out of 20 kids that I ran around with, 19 of us were cousins. <laughs> and so this lady is saying, now if you lay down your children, I'll get ready to tell you a story. And this is how we uh, had those stories recited and uh, learned. <coughs> and so this is really what I did when I was young, because I'd go see grandma and grandpa on Friday night and I'd go home Sunday night. And uh, me and my brother would be there. And uh, what happens is we would cut wood, uh, we'd chop wood, we'd cut wood, we'd pick up apples, uh, get the carrots, uh, clean fish, uh, run the smokehouse, you know, whatever needed to be done. Uh, we'd be there with grandma and grandpa and uh, just help out. Did, did you may help make that, some of that stuff? Yeah, I probably gathered a lot of it. Wow. Well, until, why well, even today, Uh, we're basket makers, and we use a lot of raw material, a lot of na native material. And um, we have places to go through the year. And uh, what happens is that um, when I was young, I'd be you know, going with my kids and myself and my children, and uh, we'd harvest. And uh, we get the material, you have to take it home. Then you gotta clean it, you gotta cut it, you gotta sort it. You got to spread it, you know, dry it. You had to uh, separate it for color and texture and coarseness. I mean, there's a lot of uh, nuances that you want to be aware of. And um, that's what we did. And uh, we would know where to go and at the particular time of the year, what to look for and things like that. So um, that uh, activity is still continuing today because when you look at my sisters and my nieces and my nephews, with the basket makers, we still need the same raw material. And so we still harvest, and uh, we still do that. But now I'm old, so I just have to be in the car and work and watch and hide my hair and stay home and things like that. Do you ever take people out to, to show the different materials and stuff that you use or find and stuff? Well, I think the way we did it is, um, I'm getting old and um, a lot of the uh, knowledge and a lot of the activities that I and my brothers and sisters participate in are being lost and the uh, geographic locations that we go to are not remembered. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with Joe Lynn here, for the last three years, uh, we probably drove 2,000 miles. Mm -hmm. We'd take off seven o'clock Saturday morning, we'd get home at dark time Saturday night. And we'd go to the various rivers, to the housing sites, uh, to the oyster fields, <laughs> to the razor mm -hmm. clam areas, to the ocean. Um, with uh, Joanne's help, uh, we knew where the um, weirs were for the fish. And there's one weir in Hokim and another weir out there in Alcoka. You can still see the sticks in the ocean. Where the people had 
major uh, weirs to trap the, uh, the salmon. And uh, what we did is uh, me and my um, children and one of my nieces, uh, Joanne, and maybe one or two other people, um, we would drive around. So all together, I imagine we have close to 60 hours of uh, recordings. We got probably two or 3,000 miles, probably about 20 or 30 days of traveling. Because what I did is I took everybody with me and they took their pictures and we recorded it and they marked their maps so that uh, they could remember what I remembered from a long time ago. So anyway, uh, we're about ready to wrap it up, but uh, who can tell me what this is? Birds and feathers, maybe? Hmm? Feathers? I thought maybe picking up- Last person in the traveling party. I thought maybe picking up trash, because there probably wouldn't be much, so I thought maybe collecting food along the way to feed to the next boat. Okay. A long time ago, um, in the 1800s, when people traveled, how did they travel? Canoe. Okay, canoe. And what did you have to do in the canoe? Bail. <laughs> well, yeah. Canoe, canoe bail. Taking the water out of the boat. Mm -hmm. Like you use a can or something? Uh, we didn't have cans a long time ago. We just had canoes. Awesome. Anyway. <laughs> oh, it must have been uh, 1998. We went to um, Lincoln City. And my mother was strong. She made baskets her whole lifetime. And it was a vanishing art, and she uh, persevered. So in the 60s and 70s, uh, she had her art classes, her basket classes, her painting classes, her knitting classes. She had all of these items, and the people that would be attending would be non-Indians. But she says at least someone's learning. So she kept on going, and finally in about 85, 90, the Indians started coming back. And they started making baskets. They started making their woolen items. They started using cedar. Uh, they started bringing back the uh, designs and the colors. And uh, what happened was um, they made a basket association. And um, we had our first meeting in uh, Lincoln City. So my mother is you know, the chairman of the group. Uh, my sisters are there. They're only like 50, but they're you know, doing a lot of things. And um, I just sit there smiling around, talking to everybody, because I knew almost everyone that my mother knew. So we'd sit there and talk and everything. And finally, it was in the afternoon, and uh, I'm just sitting there drinking my Pepsi. And they said, uh, we have a special announcement. We have a storyteller today. And uh, his name is Curtis Dupuy. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to do this. <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, so I went up there and everyone knew I was a storyteller. So what happened was, um, I got ready to tell the story and I said, so I'll tell you how come we started making baskets a long time ago. I said, when the people and birds and animals were young, you know, we had to uh, carry eggs, and strawberries, and apples, and clothes, and things like that. And we didn't have anything to carry them in. So what they did was they would go and look for bird's nests. And so, you know, with the baby robin's nest or a crow's nest, you could carry something. But if you wanted something big, well, you got an eagle's nest. <laughs> but the eagle's nest was too big to carry. You know, it was hard. I mean, you, you just carry the nest, you couldn't carry anything with it. So anyway, that's what people did for a long time. Finally, one time, a uh, person was walking around and um, she sat down in the grass next to the cattail. And she was wondering, you know, like, gosh, we got to do something better. I wonder what can happen. 
Well, she was looking at her uh, bird's nest and she seen how it was woven together. And she says, I wonder if there's something we can use while well, she's sitting next to the cattails. And she says, well, maybe if I cut the cattail, I can use it. So you cut that cattail and the stalks there and you separate it. So then you have individual slices and then you can weave them together. So that's how we started doing that. And then uh, they said, well, we want something stronger. We want something uh, more durable. So another person was walking along the river and it was raining and uh, she had fish to take home and everything. And she couldn't carry very much in her basket. And she said, oh, I wonder what I can do. Well, anyway, uh, there was a tree that fell over and the roots came out and all the roots were splintered. So the lady looked at it and she says, I wonder if I could take those roots and if I could weave them into a basket. And so that's what she did. So anyway, through the years, as time went on and everything, what happened was people said, well, we want to make our designs. We want to remember what a bird looks like. We want to honor the quail. We want to see the crow and things like that. So what happened is that uh, they started uh, putting these designs on them. And they learned how to make their colors and things like that. So. I got a standing ovation for that story. Mm. And I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm open to questions if anyone has questions. Mm. I must have spoke well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was very good. All right, but anyway, uh, 50 years ago, in what, 1972, I met my wife here. Well, I didn't know I was going to marry her until two years later. But uh, this is where we started from. <laughs> did she ask you or did you ask her? No, I asked oh. her. <laughs> just kidding. We uh, just had you know, a lot of good times together. So what did you think? What story did you like? Yeah. Yeah. The mosquito ones. Remember, how come we have all those baby mosquitoes today? How come? Yeah, because um, they grew in the Yeah, they were too small. You couldn't get them. That's how come they're still here today. Compared to their bigger ones, their mom and dad. How did they? How did the mosquitoes get into the hunt birds and what? did they did hunt birds or deer or their their food? I mean did they use spears or well that's always a good question and everything and we see all the bones in the archaeology in the archaeology areas and everything. But uh, remember we just had uh, bows and arrows. And you might have had that uh, what that the avalanche or something that you could throw hard. Yeah. So and they snuck had, up on you. And you had your sticks and everything, but when you go after an elk, that's a big animal, and uh, when he runs, he's going to run through the woods where you and me are just going to get hung up and everything. <laughs> but we could get, you know, the raccoons and the beavers and the muskrats, uh, you know, uh, you could uh, lay in the water, you know, by where the geese came and everything. So there's a lot of smaller items that we could get, plus all the same. So that's how we did that. Do you have an Indian name? What? Do you have a, a different name, an Indian name? I do, but I don't use it. Do you want to share with us what it is? Yeah, you're supposed to keep them quiet. Okay. Only certain people know who they are. Okay. Okay, well, on behalf of the uh, Oakville Library and uh, in uh, memory of the American Indian Heritage Month, we're a little bit late, but the reason being is it took a long time for the Timberland Library to approve the uh, speaking arrangements, and you had to pass your criminal background check. <laughs> oh, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm glad that each and every one of you came. I uh, have these artifacts here that you could look at, and I don't mind you holding them and touching them and things like that. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.